here. <laughs> All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to lecture number three. Uh, before I start with the slides, so uh, there is, as someone mentioned, there's a small cultural experience of Switzerland for those that like the back bar with the coffee and <laughs> Swiss chocolates. So oh, yes. Yeah, I'll, okay. try that. I'll be the first. And I'm not going to take them all, so please help yourself. Um, yeah, before starting the third lecture, so usually what you see is a picture of a diamond device with MB centers, and they're also going to do the talk of the day uh, using our experiments. I don't know whether I'll get to this, to show you some of these images, so I'll show one on the first slide, and then I'll come to the topic of the day. So what you see here is a piece of diamond, about 0.9 microns in size. It has a small tip here, and at the end here is presumably one single MB center. Uh, the goal is to scan these over surfaces and take magnetic energy. Um, so here's some silicon handle that goes onto a quartz tuning fork and onto a chip. But these are the devices that you can actually charge, try use one qubit scanning at one defined location for doing magnetic imaging, so read applications of the um, So the one that I'd like to talk today is actually starts off very differently and it's a, a long-term visionary goal of many of those nanoscale, very sensitive magnetic measurements. And uh, the idea here is that you probably all know MRI, probably some of you have been in an MRI too. Um, and you get these beautiful images which are 3D and can even discriminate different tissue. Uh, but what they all build upon is that they measure the magnetism of hydrogen. So magnetic nuclei. Uh, the magnetism hydrogen is extremely weak. So they need on the order of 10 to the 18 spins per voxel. That's roughly a few microns to a few hundreds of microns to to just get the signal. And then once you can do this, you can try this non-invasive imaging, build up an image. It's non-invasive. If you're surviving, if you go in an MRI tube, and so on. So the goal, the long-term goal, has been to try and scale this down to bacteria, viruses, finally to the molecular atomic scale. And the big hurdle you're facing is this number here. So this is roughly gives you an SNR, let's say, of one in one second with current technology. So you want to bridge uh, 18 orders of magnitude in sensitivity. So what people have been working on is replacing the standard detection, which is better the induction by other detection methods. One is mechanical detection, and another one could be MV centers in diamond. So uh, very sensitive, very local magnetic probes. So the far goal could be that you take now a molecule, uh, let's say a protein, which has a lot of hydrogen and also other elements that have magnetic nuclei, and try to measure the moment, the magnetic field of a single spin, and then in a the second step, try to combine it with imaging, such that you can unravel and uh, get 3D positions of all the atoms in such a molecule. So you have a true single molecule so this doesn't exist today, but it's one of the far and visionary goals. And what we're trying to do is to implement this with NV centers. So take this cartoon here, we have a diamond chip with an NV center spin cube very close to the surface. We could put the molecule on top and then try to detect the uh, magnetic stray fields that's coming from all the nuclei here. They may be different elements. The strongest, one of the strongest magnetic moments is from hydrogen, but carbon has what well. Nuclear spin, carbon 13. There is nitrogen, almost all elements have one isotope at least, which has a, a magnetic nucleus. And they're usually characterized by a strength and also by a precession frequency. So MRI works by measuring frequencies and converting the frequency to spatial information or to chemical information. So we try to do, to do not only very sensitive magnetic measurements, but also very uh, spectroscopically well defined frequencies. So the new topic of today is not going to be quantum sensing, how you measure something with a qubit, but how we can do very precise frequency measurements, how you confirm um, a qubit into a spectrum analyzer. So what we would like to do is now devise protocols such that we can hook up, let's say, uh, a single MV center to a spectrum analyzer and take high resolution spectrum. And then if you can do this, you can apply it to this problem, look at several spectral frequencies and then try to uh, calculate back what frequency corresponds to what nucleus. And I'm going to show you some examples of how this works. 
Okay, so there are three topics for today. First, I want to just introduce you to how you can do AC and not DC measurements with qubits. And in the end, actually, very high resolution with the qubits. So I'm going to show you two methods. One we call dynamical decoupling spectroscopy. Uh, many of you may know dynamic decoupling is a way to extend the coherence time. And there's another nickname, which is the quantum locking. And you're going to see why people call it like this. Um, so this is kind of a uh, starting point. And then there are several steps in between which I'm going to leave out and then the end point is uh, what we call continuous sampling spectroscopy which is by now the method that gives you the highest frequency resolution. And then the third point is I'm going to try and apply this not to a general AC field but to a single nuclear spin. So can we follow the precession of a nuclear spin um, as it's evolving? And this is a hard task because we're trying to probe a quantum object and we don't want to so we call this weak measurement always. Okay, so let me start with the first point, uh, dynamically coupling spectroscopy. Um, so let's go to back to what we've seen previously this week, how we can do uh, make uh, quantum sensing experiments. So let's go back to this rounding spectroscopy. I'm going to show you the protocol again. I mean, I'm going to vary the protocol a lot in the end to make it sensitive. Uh, but our standard approach here is we have a signal, let's say it's a scattering field, so the blue line is not zero, it has some high value. Uh, and then we operate the quantum sensor. We have the first step, we initialize it in case of the EMP center with an optical pumping, a short through laser pulse. Um, in the Ramsey spectroscopy, we have to create a coherent superposition, so we apply a pi half rotation, so in the blob sphere we go from, a, from Z to the XY plane. Uh, we let it evolve for some time and then we have another pi half pulse to convert this back to up or down polarization, uh, which we can read out in this case using a fluorescence detection. So, what is our signal? We saw it gives an oscillation, but what we really measure is a phase. It's the phase that the qubit accumulates uh, during this time here. So, the phase, in terms of a formula, the phase is given by the integral from zero to time t. Then we have gamma, our gyromagnetic ratio, which tells us how many, how, uh, what the unit field gives you in frequency. And we integrate the magnetic field during this time here. So in this case, we have a static field, and the phase just increases linearly with time. So in this case, um, we just have a phase build up gamma times b times the time. And this is equivalent to the integral, so it's the area of this. So you've seen all of this. This is just to reintroduce uh, the scheme here of how you do a analysis spectroscopy experiment. Okay, so next task, we don't have an, an DC field, but we have an AC field. I choose a very specific one here. I choose an AC field, which for some reason here just matches the, uh, the, the length of our, our, our measurement. So what is the phase that is built up here? Zero. Zero. Very good. No phase with that. Okay, so we see this immediately, we can calculate the integral, we have a positive area here, a negative area here. So the first bottom line, which is just a Ramsey spectroscopy, it's not so easy to do AC measurements. This is now an extreme case, there is zero phase build up. If the frequency wouldn't really match here, there would be some phase build up, but not really much. If the frequency is very fast, we have many oscillations, then it tends to go to zero in any case. So this scheme here doesn't really give you AC phase. Good, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add something in between here to make this sensitive to AC. So what we're going to do is a spin echo experiment. Um, I think some of you know what it is, some didn't, and I was about to look up my Python code that gives you these nice movies of uh, uh, how the echo works. I couldn't find it, so I went to Wikipedia, which is also recommended to you, uh, just to explain what's happening if we do this kind of thing. So we apply half pulse, rotates into the plane, then we have a precession. We apply a high pulse, so 180 degree rotation around one axis, let it be the x-axis. So we just flip over to the other side, and then the precession continues, and we recollect. And in the cartoon and Wikipedia, uh, it's not going to show you this for one spin, for one experiment, or, but for uh, several spins which have slightly different magnetic fields. Or you could say you repeat the experiment several times, and each time, this field here, for some reason, has slightly drifted. 
So this is how it looks like. We apply pulse, we go into the plane, each arrow corresponds to a different spin. We make them only in degree pulse. And you see, at the double time here, a so-called echo forms. So we have here a phase build-up, but then the phase build-up is inverted. And it really looks like if we were running time backwards. So you could say we have really a quantum mechanical evolution. There's a phase defacing, signal disappears. But then we do something with this high pulse here to invert the axis of time, we just run backwards. And at two, time, two times t here, we're back to our original situation. So we build up an echo. And it's actually a very famous experiment because it showed for one of the first time how we can introduce reversibility into a quantum system which seemed to have to go here. Um, so what we see here is that what well, we build up phase in this period, but then we build up the opposite phase in the second period. So if you now for this case calculate what is the phase build up, so we have the DC signal here, then the phase build up is positive in the first half, but because we inverted time, it's negative in the second period, and the two phase build ups exactly cancel. So the phase phase build up here is zero. So now we have a new sequence, which is not sensitive to DC fields anymore. And this is one reason why spin up codes are also liked by the community. If you have any small variations in magnetic fields, you're going to have dephasing, so you can eliminate all this dephasing, or you have a big ensemble, and there is a magnetic field gradient, and in homogeneity, you can also refocus it. So it makes the whole coherence, so to say, more robust. Yeah? Oh, oh question. Uh, what's the purpose of later here, like in measurement and array? Um, what's the purpose of? What's the function of later part? Of this one here? Yes. Okay, so for the NV center, it's the purpose is to initialize or polarize the NV center, and then here to read out the final state. Is. Also, that is for NV center. Yeah, so in, in a very generic scheme uh, presented with quantum sensing, you initialize your sensor, you do a sensing, a phase build up, and then you probe what the final state is. So this here is the purpose to pump the NV center into the zero state in a very well-defined initial state. Then here there is an evolution, and in the end we just inspect, are we still in zero or <coughs> in one? Because we have to somehow find out what our NV center is. So these are simply here to probe, to read out the NV center. But the actual sensing happens between the two dash lines. OK. So is there never a reason that you would want an even number of spin echo pulses? Um, you can do it with an even number. I'm only going to use an odd. No, I will have some even numbers here as well. So, so it doesn't really matter how many. So if you had an even number of, of spin echo pulses, yeah. you would get some DC sensitivity, right? And you would lose your okay. DC sensitivity, but it would so, yeah, the next step, we're going to do that soon, is we can either vary, for example, the location of this pi pulse here, or we can add more pulses. And then for each sequence that we have, we can analyze whether you are a DC signal or not. And actually, I'll present the general formula in a few slides. Um, so, we can capture this more generally by uh, assigning a sort of modulation function to this sequence here. So, we can identify times where the time goes in a positive direction or in a negative direction, or where phase build up is positive or negative. Uh, so this modulation function, you can enter it in the phase build up here, and it's just going to have a positive sign during the first period, and it's going to change sign whenever we apply a pi pulse. Um, if you have more pi pulses, it's just going to be a, a more complex modulation function, but it only has the two values of minus one and one. So this now allows us to assign to a sequence this modulation function, we can just calculate what the phase is. So this would, for any general function, you can then solve this integral and we tell you what the phase is. <coughs> okay. Um, so we can do this for the spin echo here, and we get the modulation top down, and then if you apply the modulation, you see there's a phase build up. Um, Sorry, and I'll change, I keep the echo and I change to an AC signal. We can run through the same analysis. We apply the modulation function. Um, we look at, we have a positive build up here, negative, but now this is multiplied by our negative modulation function. So our phase build up is now non zero. 
So we have now an AC signal, but using this echo sequence, we actually reintroduce the ability to measure AC signal. And we can calculate what the phase field of this, and for this very specific case here, where we start exactly at the zero here, and we go set a sine function. The phase field of is given, so you, you, really, uh, you see the core here again, gamma, the uh, AC field times time, that's the same as before. There's a scaling factor because the magnitude here is not always at its maximum. It's just because we have the envelope here, it's slightly reduced. Again, this is simply the, it reflects the integral of the sign. And in addition, there is actually a factor which depends on the relative phase of the signal. So the relative phase of the signal here, alpha is zero, meaning we start with the sign. But if we now shift this AC signal with respect to our sequence, we can actually change this alpha factor here. Um, so if we, for example, shift this by 180 degrees with a negative sign, we get a negative buildup here and also negative buildup. So our phase buildup in total changes time. Yeah. Um, before you, you did this, you had your AC thing and it zeroed out. Yeah. Um, um, this one why not do that? Because isn't it easier to zero something than to maximize something? Um, so like if you, zero. Zero, if you zeroed it out, you would know that it would have to fit in there, right? Okay, now, was it this slide? Uh, that would be back. Were they like, uh, subtracted each other? Where you had the uh, AC field, and then they subtract each other, and then that's what you oh, really yeah. want. Okay. Yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Why, like, why not do it that way? Because you know the time, so you know what would have to fit in there to yeah. zero it out. Yeah. But, so isn't it easier to zero something out? Like experimentally, than it is to maximize what you're doing, which is trying to add. Yeah. So in the end, it's easier to zero something out. But what we're gonna on zero out is uh, preferred by many people because zeroing out means you basically build up no phase, and usually it's not intended that you build up phase. You want to have a very well protected qubit, meaning no defacing. What we're gonna exploit here in the end is actually the very specific conditions where it doesn't zero out. So this is going to give us our um, So this will simply to motivate that the ROM sequence alone doesn't allow you to, in a general way, to detect AC signals. Good. So now, if we come, uh, if we repeat our echo experiment now with an AC signal, uh, we see that things don't zero out anymore. We see that we build up this phase. And an additional thing we learned, there is not only a change in amplitude, but there is also a relative phase dependence. So for alpha equal 0, it looks like this. For alpha equal 180 degree, it looks like this. I don't have the cases for 90 or 270 degree, but then it would start at the maximum here. And then it would actually cancel out. So you not only are able now to sense a, an AC field, but you're actually sensitive to the relative phase of so this will lead to the notion of the quantum locking. Locking is also phase sensitive. Good. So this is the generic scheme how we can uh, reintroduce AC sensitivity by placing a pi all zero in the center. Good. So now we're going to go one step further. We're going to add more pulses. So in this case, eight pi pulses. The pi pulses here are distributed in a way that you still don't have an AC signal, uh, a DC, a, DC uh, a phase shift from a DC. Um, so we can do the same analysis here. We can just find out what we have our phase filter. We can find what the modulation function is. Uh, in this case, I chose the signal in a way that it actually just matches this modulation function. And then we can calculate what the total phase filter is. So this is now already a very specific situation. I chose my uh, high pulses to be exactly happening at all the zero crossings. So the modulation function and the AC signal here, they are exactly in synchrony. So if we now multiply the two, we get a down modulation of the signal, and you get a positive phase fit up again. So we can extend what we have for a simple echo to many pulses, and again, we strategically place the pulses where our signal has zero crossings. Um, if the frequencies were not the same, meaning the modulation function has a different frequency because we choose a different value between pulses, then the two wouldn't be in synchrony and 
over long times, the phase buildup will be zero or almost zero. So we can analyze this behavior as a function of the frequency of our modulation function or just as a function of this parameter tau here. So if you do this, you get a, a pretty complex function, which looks like this. So it's a zinc function, and then it has a, some modulation terms. Uh, and if you plot this out, so how big is your phase buildup as a function of this parameter tau here, which sets the frequency of the red modulation? Uh, you get a so-called filter function. So this means for which, assuming I have, a, in this case, a fixed value of tau, and I scan the signal frequencies from a low frequency to a high frequency, for most frequencies, there's not going to be any phase buildup, or almost no phase buildup. Unless I exactly hit one of those resonances where the red curve and the blue curve are in synchrony, or it could even be that the blue curve is that well, three of those lobes fit into one here for five. So I get a resonance at what we call k equals one, this will be the case here, at the frequency which is three times higher, so we have a positive, negative, positive flow within one modulation, uh, or then five, seven, uh, nine, and so on. So what we now have is a sequence which is a filter. So whatever frequency we apply, only very specific frequencies actually need to a phase filter. So this makes our qubit now sensitive to very specific frequencies. Most obviously this one because it has the strongest response. That one has already a smaller phase filter. So you can say there's a phase filter for a, a large number of pulses if our AC signal is a multiple, an odd multiple of 1 over 2 tau. So 2 tau is the periodicity of the modulation function. Or if it's a multiple of the frequency of the modulation function. So this is kind of the trick. By doing dynamic decoupling, we get no phase phase buildup in most regions here, which is what people exploit with dynamic decoupling. But there are some resonance conditions where the decoupling really fails. And we can exploit these conditions to uh, perform AC measurements. Uh, you can draw this another way, and this is why it's called the quantum locking. You have your signal, uh, and you have your modulation function. You put them in a mixer, so you multiply the two, and then you get a double frequency and a DC component. We filter out the higher uh, components simply. The filtering happens by integrating over the whole duration here. So what we get in the end is the in phase component um, of the down modulated signal. So what we mathematically do is actually we, we have a lock in uh, detection. Good. So this is how we can do uh, AC measurements, and if you now want to build up the spectrums, so our spectrum analyzer, what do you do if you have a lock-in available in the lab? You just scroll through the frequency knob very slowly and record at each point how much signal you, uh, you collect. Okay, so let me show you some experiments, because all we want to do is this, to apply this finally to our nuclear spin uh, uh, detection. So this was the cartoon I showed you. We have a diamond chip. You want to place a molecule on top and then measure the different frequencies of the nuclei here. Um, this is a very hard experiment. It involves a lot of material science. So you have to place an emission very close to the surface. You need a very clean surface. You won't have one molecule there. So to start with, although we can start to be able to do this, we want an easier toy model. And the toy model we usually have is something like this. We still have a diamond chip. Uh, we don't put one molecule on top. We just exploit all the naturally occurring adsorbates that are on the surface. Usually it's a few nanometers of hydrocarbons in the water, and they have a lot of hydrogen. So we can just collect the, uh, detect the collective magnetic field of all the hydrogen atoms um, on the surface. In addition, if you want to probe certain locations of spin, so we're going to try to do distance measurements, we can exploit the diamond made of carbon. Carbon is 99% carbon-12, no nuclear spin, but it's 1% carbon-13, carbon which is a spin one half nucleus. So this is a low density, but it's just a very convenient density. Whenever you have a recenter, you can be sure somewhere in the surroundings there's going to be one, two, or three carbon-13s. And we can use this as a test to do distance measurements, how far away is one of those carbon-13 nuclei. Um, there's also an M50 nuclei or M14, which is part of the MB-centric cell. Both have um, 
So very briefly, how do we get these 10 nanometers? We usually buy these very high pure, high pure single crystals of diamonds. Then we go to a facility where they can implant nitrogen. So we shoot nitrogen at ions into the surface at a very low energy, and then we know roughly where they stop. Um, once you have the nitrogen in there, they also form vacancy. So they leave some, some trace of, of damage. And if you knew this out at about 800 degrees, then the vacancy is diffused, and they form pairs with the nitrogen. So you have an enemy set for it. Um, we sometimes do additional tricks. We sometimes use to see 12, not for the following experiments. We have really the nuclear bath eliminated. Uh, we sometimes structure the surface. So uh, this is image before. We make, for example, these pillars that we also have for scanning pillars who have a better wave guiding and collect is it possible to isotopically enrich carbon to the to isotope 12 and then use the like high pressure, high temperature to make it allow isotopically enriched? So yes, it is. So these are CBD grown, but there I think you can at least maybe not commercially, but through collaboration get anything from 99% to 13 to 0 0.01 or even less. So, so you can yes, you can get can to the C12 or C13 content over a large range. And is that, is that what gives you the upper bound on T2? So for, for, for these times here, the upper bound is either set if you have too much nitrogen, uh, like if you plant too high a density of nitrogen, which is a donor, it's a spin one half electron, then this limits, limits T2. If you're able to keep your nitrogen concentration low, as in these crystals, then C13 is the limit. For DC measurements, around C measurements. So then you can try and reduce the T13 content and get it lower. In addition, if you're close to the surface, there's always some magnetic defect on the surface. Um, so then it may that may be the limit. So these are the samples that we So let me show one spectrum. So what we do is we apply a magnetic field of uh, 300 milli Tesla, and then we just take it over a whole range of frequencies. So each of those points here is one uh, setting of the locking. And we do a measurement and look how much signal we collect. And the height here really reflects when there's a high peak, we have a lot of phase accumulated. When it's low, there is almost no phase accumulated. So you see there's actually quite a lot of structure in this spectrum. So what we really do is we sit at the location of an emissent and we listen around at what frequency do I hear magnetic noise. And then now we try to backtrace if I hear noise at a certain frequency, like here or here. What was it coming from? Um, so this is not so. This is quite easy anymore because there's a lookup table that tells you if you know the field at what frequency do we expect the nucleate to resonate. So here's the table for this experiment here. And hydrogen is expected at seven megahertz, C13 at 1.8, and then N15 uh, is at a lower number, but it has a strong hyperfine coupling. So the, the values we expect are those here. So now we can already go in and just like a fingerprint identify. If an enemy sent it close to the surface, you see the hydrogen on the surface. Um, this one is carbon 13, and then we also see hydrogen. There's a few more peaks which I'm not going to go into. Um, but another thing we can do is, for example, we can zoom in on the hydrogen peak, and we can actually use the magnitude of this peak to gauge how close we are to the surface. If you're closer, there's more noise because we're just closer to the surface. Um, so here are four measurements of different hydrogen peaks, and then we can fit them, and we can actually derive how deep the MB center is. So this is the shallowest we've ever seen, two nanometers from the surface, more typically of those numbers here, of the five nanometers. And we can also calculate how many nuclei contribute to the signal. And the volume for this one here is about 1.8 nanometer voxel, or about 100 nuclei. Yeah. Yep. How do you test where your MB center is? What's the if you if you say I calculated based on my NMR signal that this NB center is 1.9 nanometer deep, how do you then go and check so that? We know it's 1.9 nanometers. Yeah. So we have no independent way of verifying, but it's a very well posed experiment. <coughs> so we can, from a model, very precisely calculate uh, what the expected magnetic field is as a function of distance, and then this measurement gives us a precise value experimental value for the field. So we just take the field and then look at what distance gives us that field. It's mainly dependent on density and how far away you are and which magnetic nucleus it is. 
you need a pretty clean sample run. So, um, you can count that or no? Yes or no. So we need a sample which has on the surface atoms. But it turns out that, okay, we can easily do this. We can take some substance and put it in the surface. But it turns out even if you don't put it there, there's enough moisture from the air that um, it can principle go on the measure molecule. So this is roughly order of 100 of the eye. So if you go from 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 2, this is kind of the steps we're trying to take. Um, so let me comment on another uh, important aspect. We don't only want to know what element we have, but we also want to know how far away, or even what the 3D position is, because this allows you to do molecular imaging. So we try to measure distances from our central spin to the surrounding nuclear spin. Um, the way MRI does this, they have gradient coils, so they change the magnetic field with distance, and then they know, if they measure a certain frequency, they know what position it was. And we can do something very similar here by exploiting that our electron spin here is a dipole. So it has a magnetic dipole field that decays as part of the cube if you go away, and it has also a distance dependence. So in another picture, it looks like this. So we have our central electron spin here, and then we can define polar coordinates, so look at this is here. We have a distance, and then we have a polar angle, and we have an angle phi here. And the uh, dipolar field, it depends on distance on this polar angle, but it doesn't depend on the phi angle. It's rotationally symmetric. So we should, in the first shot, uh, be able to gauge how far away the spin is and what the angle is by looking at the strength of the magnetic field or the gradient induced by this central spin on the nuclear spin. So how does this look in the experiment? What we can do is we can zoom in on the carbon-13 portion here. And I'm taking a particularly nice MV center which has eight carbon-13 in surroundings. And the spectrum you obtain there looks like this. So you now not only see one resonance, so we expect from the lookup table the resonance to be at this position, but you see several peaks which are closer or further away from the central line. So those that are far away experience a lot of feedback the electric spin that presumably closer and the ones that are close to the central line experience little extra field and they're presumably further away. Uh, in addition from the height of the peaks, if you combine that information into it, you can uh, find out what these two parameters are. So we have two pieces of information, peak height and distance from the central line, which gives us these, these two parameters. So we can assign numbers and in this case we get the values between 0.7 nanometers and uh, yeah, some degree numbers of this polar angle. Um, so this works pretty efficiently, but in the end you'll be able to do this 3D. And I'm not going to go into detail with this, but I'm going to show you there's a trick to actually record this third angle. So this third angle of phi here. So what we implemented is a, an additional coil that allows us to change the magnetic field, at least uh, temporarily, so tilting the electron spin out of the, its preferred axis. So if you tilt the spin, the hyperfine field will change. And we can record two sets of values, one for the vertical orientation, one for the tilted orientation. And in the end, this allows you to back calculate uh, what also this angle phi is. Uh, for this, we have to implement some microcoils that allow us to apply a strong field for a short period of time. And I'm just going to show you the result. If you do this calculation, you use an MV with four nuclear spins. And each, so here's the MV center. Each grade point denotes a lattice site. And you can now really go and even many lattice sites away, get uh, almost uh, single site precision, where in 3D these, or is it one, two, three, four nuclear are located. So on this very small scale, within a diamond, we are able to do this 3D triangulation find out what the 3D molecules are. So the next step would be to go outside of diamond and uh, try to apply this to a molecule, which is difficult from a surface chemistry perspective, but also signals will be weaker, and the frequency shifts are also going to be smaller. So we need an ability to measure smaller signals and resolve frequencies with much higher resolution than we have here. Okay, so this brings me to the second um, uh, topic here. So we have uh, seen we need a very high frequency resolution. We would like to make this as good as possible. So just to show where we are right now with this method of the quantum locking, here's the spectrum now zoomed in. 
And you can analyze how big the peak is. Um, we saw the peak width is in the order of 10 to 20, 30 kilohertz. The width of this peak is given by the duration of our quantum locking sequence. It's a Fourier relationship. So if you make our quantum locking sequence longer and longer, this number goes down. But we can't make the sequence arbitrarily long. We limit it by T2. And T2 is in the order of 10 to the 100 microseconds, which is using this number. So this quantum locking allows you to go to some level <coughs> with frequency resolution, but not beyond that. So our group, but also many other groups, have spent a lot of time on improving this. And I'm going to show you very rapidly the brief steps, but only on the comment on the last one. So this was 2011. Uh, we have some developments in 2014, down to 1 kilohertz, 2016, down to 37 hertz, and the uh, most recent one was 2004, last year, uh, in the millihertz range. So I'm not going to tell you how we did those here, but I'm going to show you how you can arrive at this very high resolution. And it's actually a very simple trick. So how can you get much higher resolution? So let's say you have an AC signal. And we probe it with our quantum locking. So we, in this long AC signal, which is very coherent, we just had a small window where we apply our quantum locking and we take our measurements. So we have our sequence here, we initialize, we have our pulses, and then we do a readout. And so we've seen this is the locking has to be in sync, so we have to be on resonance, but we also see, and this is what we're going to use here, that we are sensitive to the relative phase of the signal. If you had a sign, you had a maximum signal. If you had a minus sign, you had a negative signal. So if, the, if you shift your sequence with respect of the signal, then you have a phase sensitivity. So if you look this up, you can actually say that you're sensitive, if you, depending on the sequence here, to what your value of this AC signal was at the very beginning when you started your sequence. So what we actually record, so to say, although we record over a whole block, we can get a value of this x of t at time zero when we started the sequence. So what we now can do is we cannot just use one sequence, but we can use a whole series of sequences, which we time on a synchronized clock. So we just perform a series of lock-ins, and the output we get of each of those lock-in measurements is the value when we started the sequence. So we eventually record on the blue points, which lay on this gray, heavily undersampled trace of the signal. So if we just add one locking measurement after the other, uh, after the other we record a heavily undersampled version of our original signal. But if, uh, the free, if there were several frequencies close by, you could still resolve this so let me show you one experiment where we did this. So we had one additional twist here. I showed, I told you that the readout of MV centers is extremely inefficient. We did the trick in this experiment to get it more efficient. So in a non-efficient ferric experiment, you get maybe 0.1 photon per readout. Uh, in this case, we used the trick to get between 100 and 300 photons per readout. Um, so what you then record is you record photons at each point here, just a photon number. And this is the trace. So these are uh, 300 points here. Uh, on th at each point, we have between 140 and 260 photons. In this case, we were already almost in the signal shot regime. So you see, get mostly low points and mostly high points, and all the noise on it is, is sharp, multiple sharpness. Um, so this presumably contains our signal. The signal here was roughly 1 megahertz, and it had sidebands spaced by 10 millihertz. So in order to get this frequency spectrum back, we simply take the whole trace, and the trace here was a duration of one hour, and we make a Fourier transform. And what we have recorded is a beautiful spectrum where you have your central line, so it's a relative frequency, and two sidebands, which were your uh, extra frequencies. But you see that the frequency resolution is simply given now by the point spacing, and the point spacing is one over one hour, which is 180 microhertz, or if you wait more than one hour, it just the resolution goes down. So this is a very simple experiment, uh, but it actually, it's very powerful in a way because it's so simple, uh, you can just extend and go beyond any T1 or T2 times of your set. Okay, um, so one additional thing, you see there's a relative frequency here, 
So it can get very high frequency resolution, but actually we would like to know what is the absolute value because this is, what, this is in many cases the chemical information. So we would go back and be able to um, recover what this blue fast frequency was. And it turns out there's a very simple trick to that. And the trick is that you record not one of those traces, but several of them. So in this case, we had a sampling rate of 750 hertz. So at each about 1.5 milliseconds, we took 1.8. And then uh, we made this Fourier transform. And in this case, we had seven frequencies, and not only three. Uh, if you change the sampling rate just slightly, those peaks are going to, sh to shift. And they shift a lot because it's such a heavy understanding. So we can record a number of spectra. It's also seven here, but it could be any number. So we get a lot of different spectra with just slightly different sampling rates. And it turns out it's a very well posed problem in information theory. So you can then do a, a reconstruction that allows you to, from these different sampling rates, get back the original absolute frequency. So in this case, we had seven frequencies in two frequency bands, one at 400 kilohertz, one at uh, one, uh, 0.2 megahertz. Uh, four frequencies here, three frequencies here. So you're able to get the absolute value of the frequency back. And at least for these quantum sensing and recenter experiments, this is pretty nice because you get now at an absolute frequency of one megahertz, a precision, a resolution of about 100 microhertz, and the precision of the peak that you measure is actually in the nanohertz range. So you cover uh, about <coughs> orders of magnitude in frequency space. How precise can you get? It's all determined by how precisely you can clock your signal. So apply your pulses. So we benefit from, in the end, atomic clocks that give us a very precise timekeeping signal. And we're able to lock into that signal. OK, so this was kind of a, this is as far as this frequency spectroscopy with qubits has advanced. But it's still artificial in that we apply a signal, actually, that we know roughly what that frequency is. But we would like to apply this to the NMR case. And this is where it actually becomes quite interesting. So we'd like to apply this to single spins to get very high resolution frequency measurement. Um, so what we have to do is, and I kind of stole watching at least from uh, class talk, so uh, we would like to watch how a spin precesses and just apply the same scheme to single nuclear spin. And this is less easy because all of you know, as soon as we try to watch what a quantum object does, we are influencing it. So the question that comes up, can we even do that? Or uh, how well can we do that? What is the influence going to be? Um, so to get me started, uh, let's just go back and what we did in the basic case. So in a classical signal, we had an AC signal and we could model it like a nuclear spin that's rotating in the glass here. And we just Every so often we go in at some times and record one component, uh, let's say the X component of this precession, and we rebuild up our record. And the assumption is if it's classical, this thing just keeps precessing, and whenever we measure it, it doesn't even feel that we measured it. So what happens if you have a nuclear spin? So it precesses when we don't do a measurement. Once we do a measurement, there's actually uh, the nuclear spin and the electron spin start to become entangled. You can point, uh, kind of draw this on the blob sphere in that the nuclear spin now gets tilted out of the plane. Uh, it's shown to go up here, but actually you could say it also goes down. It's an entangled state. But you start to build up a probability that the nuclear spin goes up or down as you do the measurement. Um, so you have to do the measurement because you want to know what the nuclear spin does. But it turns out that the angle that you flip the spin out of the plane is the same phase that you collect that actually makes your signal. So if you measure very weakly, uh, you have a very small effect. This spin will tell very little, but you also collect very uh, a small amount of signal. Your SNR is going to be bad. Um, so the rotation here is given, rotation phi is given by the number of pulses we use in the quantum locking sequence times the time tau, times some constant. So this is the hyperfine coupling constant. If your nuclear spin and electron spin are strongly coupled, there's going to be a bigger effect. Um, and this rotation angle phi here is the important number in this case, so it symbolizes how strong we do the measurement. If you had a phi equal 90 degree, you would actually completely have the nuclear spin going up or down. And if you do a readout measurement, then we have completely lost track of what our nuclear spin relation does. 
So, um, the, the signal that we measure here, and this is not shown, is proportional to phi. If you measure twice as long of the quantum locking, the signal is twice as big. Um, if you look at what, this, this, uh, what the reduction of your uh, length of the nuclear vector on the block here is along x, this reduction is the phi squared. So as we tilted the slight amount out of the plane, it's still mostly in the plane. And the bad thing we really have is as we go higher up. So this looks like a, a good situation. We want to maximize power here to maximize the signal, and we want to minimize the effect on the nuclear spin, so we have a minimum phi here. And this is a square, and this is not a square. So we're well off, so it tells us that we should be able to just watch weekly, collect some signal, but still barely perturb the nuclear spin. Okay, so let me show you the, you the uh, experiment. So what we're going to do is, okay, we measure in one position, we're going to tilt it slightly, we measure in the other position, tilt it slightly again, and so on. Um, yeah, before I show the experiment, one more, and much more um, detailed picture. So what we're going to do, and this is now a more fancy block sphere, we're going to initialize the nuclear spin along x, and then it's going to start precessing. We do nothing. And then at this point, we do a measurement. The measurement causes and this is this line that goes up and down here. It causes the nuclear spin to go out of the plane. And as soon as we, at the end of this phase acquisition, this quantum locking, measure the electron spin, we project the nuclear spin back onto the xy plane. But we project it back because we walk up that sphere. The projection takes a slightly invert. So the length of this vector, and this kind of the density matrix, um, gets shorter. So we have one measurement. We wait again, we then process in the second measurements, and with each time, the vector gets shorter. So what we expect is from our measurement simply a decay of our uh, nuclear spin. So we get an additional dephasing or additional decoherence of the nuclear spin. OK, so here's the measurement. Um, the measurement is indicated by n. So n is the number of pi pulses. This is a short quantum locking sequence. This is a long one. And this corresponds to a very weak measurement, and then we increase the strength of the measurement by just adding more pulses. So here we measure very weakly. You see the signal is small, but the oscillation persists for the whole duration. And the duration here is the things in the order of a millisecond. Each uh, point here corresponds to one measurement, so we have about 30 measurements behind after each other. We increase the strength by a factor of 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, 16, and you see the signal gets larger. But eventually, the decay becomes much faster. And at this point here, we have a large signal, but the decay, you only see a, a few points in the oscillation. So here, we are nearing the case of a strong measurement. Um, so you can analyze this in Fourier space. You can first plot the spectrum. So we see a narrow spectral peak here that grows with, as you increase the strength of the measurement, because we just collect more signal. But eventually, the line gets broader and broader, and actually, the peak comes down, so the area still grows, but the peak comes down because the peak is not spread. And if you just from far away, look which spectrum you like best to do your analysis. It's probably somewhere here. It's very narrow, but you have a sizable signal. So this already tells you you shouldn't take a very strong measurement, but you also shouldn't take a very weak measurement. There is an optimum somewhere. Um, you can analyze this as a function of this big M. So you can plot the signal amplitude. You expect it to go as sine phi. This was the magnitude of the signal. And you can also calculate for how many pulses roughly you would reach the case of strong measurement, meaning a 90 degree rotation of the English speed. It's roughly 24 pulses in this case. So here we were already quite strong, but uh, not at full strength yet. You can also plot the line width. And you see that the line width grows as phi squared, which is also expected. The line width is the k rate. This comes from this cosine in the tilting out of the plane. And as you hear, and it's not plotted already as this m of phi. You have an intrinsic line width, and then if you do a very weak measurement, you actually limit by the intrinsic line width of the carbon. And as you increase the measurement, you start to have a broader of the line, uh, a faster decoherence, because you now perform a strong and strong measurement. OK, so this is one effect. What do the weak measurements do? They still allow you to kind of trace the nuclear evolution, but if you do it too strongly, 
then you're going to add additional decoherence. Your spectrum becomes broad, which is really against what we were trying to do in the first place. OK, there is actually another effect. It's more subtle, but uh, you can realize it once you look at it more carefully. So we looked at, I'm focusing on this well, first second measurement here. We saw the vector uh, trajectory moves up or down the sphere, and we get a projection which reduces our vector. So we get a rotation out of the plane. But if you really look carefully, then you will realize there's not only a rotation out of the plane, but sometimes there is also a, an additional z rotation. So if you zoom in on this feature here, which I did literally here, you see that the rotation is not exactly towards the pole, but there's also a small amount of rotation in the xy plane. On the z-axis. And this is important because if we have a rotation in the z-axis, it appears like we had a different frequency. So meaning, if we do a measurement, do we falsify the frequency that we want to measure or not? So we have a frequency that we want to measure, now we do a weak measurement, this is going to change the frequency that we are actually trying to determine. Um, so it turns out this frequency, so this is z-rotation, it turns out this frequency is this shift, this C rotation shift, is dependent on where you measure on the sphere. Sometimes the, the Z shift is in forward direction, sometimes in backward direction. So in the measurements you've seen before here, we measure somewhere, sometimes at the top, sometimes at the bottom, so we measure at mostly random location, which is around the sphere. So we measure at random location sometimes, as shown here, we measure sometimes when it's pointing this way, um, but overall, we mostly equally distributed around the sphere where we place our measurements. So you can do this in a very bad fashion. You can now say, I'm, only me I'm always measuring, or maybe I'm just by accident, whenever the spin did a full rotation and came back here. Or you're always measuring at 90 degree locations, or always at opposite locations. And if you do this the wrong way, you always end up in uh, portions of this uh, plane where the shift is either always forward or always backward. So if you have a very strategically bad way of probing, these C rotations start adding up and you have to you have a, a cumulative effect that affects <coughs> the frequency shift. So this effect exists but it's very small. So what we do, what we did to try and find out that this is really there, is record um, a 2D experiment. So on the x scale here, you see the precession angle. So where do we place our measurements? Zero means we always measure along x. And pi here means we measure once along x and once along minus x. Um, what we plot here is the frequency spectrum. So if you would just take a cut here and make a, a 1D plot, then you have two peak positions here. So two peak positions correspond to the spectrum we saw here. We plot the position of these peaks on that scale here. So this scale the vertical scale in this 2D plot. So as we change the position where we measure, of course we're going to shift the spectral peaks. Um, and then there's these positions where they overlap, or they can also go to zero here, where you really now are really in sync with measurement. And if you zoom in on this portion, and we did this for uh, three different measurements, right? You see this picture. So here is the weak measurement, and here it gets, gets stronger, so you see there's a light crossing. But as it increases strength, there's actually a line here where the frequency is constant. And you can simulate this and you get a very similar result. So what is happening in this case is that in this very narrow range here, and it's also determined by measurements of strength, you get a frequency synchronization. At this point, you're not really probing the frequency anymore if you loop the spin, but it gets pulled towards the frequency that you're um, applying your quantum locking or allow your quantum locking probing. Can you infer anything when you're in the spot you don't want to be, like on the top of that? Here? Yeah, can you infer like that Z, like you had X amount of Z transitions in one direction, and how many of those Z you pushes know. you have, and could you use that information for anything? Um, so the question is, can you find, so we can theoretically calculate or simulate how big this C shift is. So this that is symbolized by that you can simulate the thing here. Okay. So I guess we could correct for it. I must admit this is pretty recent. So we understand now why we get this frequency synchronization, but we still haven't figured out the exact details, how big is it, and let's say 
Well, you can find out where on this sphere it happens, but you can also state sometimes the store uh, initialized loop to spin along ix on the length of line iy. Is there a different behavior? Um, so all we can say right now is we see a sim frequency synchronization, but I think it will depend on additional parameters like uh, you know, what what uh, axis do you initialize a nuclear spin, uh, and there may be other ones. But so what we could find here, there is an effect of the measurement on the frequency, but the effect is not that big. I mean, you don't really see it there, and it only happens if you're unlucky with choosing your points where you measure And if you want to avoid it, you probably just distribute them randomly by having non unique or sample, for example. So it can be avoided. Okay, so the ultimate goal here was just to go to a long measurement time. So this is the first we got there. So the idea was here just to show that with this scheme, we can measure beyond the T2 time of the uh, MV center, beyond the T1 time of the MV center, which is the goal of this uh, continuous measurement. And this is an example, we measure key one of the MV center, we get a line width, and the line width is actually narrower than you would be able to record if you were limited by the T1 of the MV center. So it just means that we can take this scheme where we had microhertz resolution, which uh, is not dependent on T2 or T1 of the qubit anymore, and apply it to nuclear spins, but we have to be very careful in the way we do it. And it also turns out it's especially suited for spins that are weakly coupled. So to us, it looks like this is the scheme to go if you want to go far away, weekly nuclear spins, and want to resolve very fine frequency resolution. Okay, so with this um, at the end, I have some pictures for scanning experiments, but I think I'm just 50 hours, so I'll probably leave this up for questions. Thank you.
and it's symmetric because in the end it's a hyperfine interaction. It's a, yeah, it has the same rotation amount, the same hyperfine interaction frequency for both the spins. So you get this singular type of interaction spin we project, and then we exploit that we move up or down. And here we are hurt by that we reduce the length of the vector. So the wanted effect for the vector spin does the same, it goes up or down, and then we measure how much, well, is it more towards one lead, towards one, or to zero. Yeah. Do you have any finite pulse effects of, of like the duration of the pulse effect? Okay, so this is an excellent question. <laughs> and yes, we do. I'm just gonna point, I can point out two of them because they're so one is in your modulation function. Uh, I'm not going to show that one. The modulation function was plus minus one. If you have a finite pulse duration, you could say it's actually not going straight from plus to minus one, but it's actually a smooth function that goes, well, you call like a cosine shape over the duration of the pulse. And the other effect that can be generated is visible in one of those spectra that we had. Almost there. Here. So we saw the three peaks here, hydrogen. So there's more peaks. There's one here, uh, but I'm actually also, also one. That one is one. And some of them are caused by finite pulse effect. Some are is k equal 3, 5, 7 higher than 1. And I think that one is one is caused by pulse effect. So we have to worry about them. Usually not, but every so often there is never. And we use very uh, dedicated sequence. So the longest sequence we used had 30,000 pi pulses. And you have to be very careful to do it right. Yeah. Are you still wanting to do the spectral reconstruction of these peak measurements, or those independent? And then if you do want to, do you need to reinitialize it and do it over again? Um, so or what do you mean with spectral reconstruction? Uh, like, the one where you, you have signing positions and frequencies that you're probing. Oh, um, you mean where you have the seven? Yeah. So, yes. Like, would you do the same thing? Or? So, in practice, probably no. The reason is, um, we first have to, maybe this one here, uh, we have to adjust the locking frequency approximately to our nuclear spin frequency. So, before we do this experiment, we just record an ordinary quantum locking spectrum to know where the resonance is. And then, once we know where the resonance is, we apply with higher and higher resolution in the end to the uh, frequency band that we're trying to probe. So usually we know the absolute frequency by a sequence of experiment which is broad and then start zooming in. And we have to start broad because we have to set the locking frequency roughly to the frequency we want to measure. But this frequency band is still very big. So we, in this case we re, uh, record with very fine resolution in the large band, in the 20 kilohertz band, and it's a lot better. So in practice, very often we go the other way. Here was normally, I mean, that it's not, well, it's not nice that we cannot know what the absolute frequency is. It turned out to be a, an elegant way to put this back in. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you, Christian, for a beautiful <laughs>